to the, the brave few with us on uh, this cold Friday. Maybe those few will, will gradually increase. Uh, have a, a large uh, herbivore for you today. It's a moose. It likes eating plants in the water. This one looks maybe a little mangy, but it's huge because it's a moose, and moose are huge. And that's all I have to say about that. It's a moose. All right. And of last time, we started talking about concurrency. And in particular, one way we wanted to employ concurrency was allow our web server to handle multiple clients at once. Uh, that in the example of our, our echo server that's just replying back with whatever uh, <coughs> whatever we had, we had the situation where <coughs> the client connected, <coughs> sent something, got it back, and then went to lunch. And now the server is just stuck waiting to service this client. and. Client two is just sad, waiting. When is the server going to uh, going to to be available? So we wanted our server to not kind of lock itself up with one client who just uh, monopolizes it. So who can remind us what our process-based approach to making our server concurrent was? One. And like the request to be forwarded, and then you set one to the, like you set the child to the new one, and like the non child to the like, Yes, we were going to call fork to create a new process, and this new process is what would actually be talking to each client. <laughs> and our server, our original process, is not handling anything with the clients beyond creating a new process when it connects. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? Chris? Um, so when it works, that fork uses more memory, right? So then basically it's like a fork, and you're not using the server, that determines like how much space you need, how many computers, or whatever. Yes, so. Uh, that's a good observation. By making our server able to handle multiple clients at once, it's now able to use many more resources than it was before. Because without calling fork, we were only handling one client ever. We only had one process for this server uh, ever. But now every time a client connects, we fork off a new, a new process. So there is some, some cost to that. And if our server is just bombarded with clients who want their input echoed back to them, then we're going to fork off a huge number of new processes. Uh, and depending on the resources available, that could cause some, some problems in terms of too much memory use or, um, or what have you. Uh, so that is something that a robust server might keep in mind, is it might keep a count of how many child processes are currently out there. and uh, wait before forking new ones if it's already at some some limit. So, uh, if that is a concern, there you would you would want to deal with it in, in that way. Other questions, Eric? If it's like a third client, does it talk to the main server and fork in there, or they want the child server? So, in this design, which I'll code up in a moment. Are all the clients will always connect with our original server process, and then for the echo part where it's reading and writing back and forth, that's what the child process will handle. So all clients will initially connect to our original server process. It will call fork and basically hand off the job of communicating with the client to that child process. Other questions? Thank you.
All right, so let's see this in code. So I'm here on Mantis, and we'll look at my echo server code. And currently, when a connection comes in, it calls the, the server process calls the echo function itself. So the server process goes into this echo function and it's just stuck there until the client closes the connection. Uh, so what we want to do instead is we want to call fork to spawn our, our new process. Uh, does anyone remember how we differentiate between the child and the parent when we call fork? Yes, Ian? Um, each gets like a one or zero, right? I don't remember which one gets what, but did you have anything like that? Yeah, fork. Fork is going to return twice. Uh, it's going to return in the parent and in the child, because the child is just a complete copy of the parent. And so after the call to fork, both child and parent are kind of at the same spot in the code right after fork returns. And the child will return, always return zero. And the parent will return the process ID of the child. And the process ID of the child will never be zero. And so we can uh, differentiate that way. So a common way to code this up is to say if the return value of fork is zero, then we want to call echo in the child, and otherwise we just want to uh, uh, yes that there we go that exit was not supposed to be there. Uh, we want to call echo in the child. Otherwise, we just kind of continue. Uh, the server just continues through the while. Yeah, Elliot. Is this fork with the capital F another one from the textbook with extra error in there? Like, what errors would also happen when you try to fork something? Yes, yeah, so uh, this capital F fork is one of these ones from the textbook that just checks uh, is the return value negative? because a negative return value from system calls indicates that there was some error. And so we'll just catch that, uh, stop the program, print out that there was a, an error with fork. Um, if we want to find out what kind of errors can happen, we can look at the manual page for fork, um, which is extensive. And on a failure, negative one is returned in the parent, no child process is created, and uh, error no, short for error number, a global variable, is set with a particular uh, value to indicate the error. And then there are all these macros, pound define, that you can check, that you can compare to this error number to find out what the error was. Uh, was there, did you hit some limit on how many processes you're able to create? Uh, uh, was there no memory available to create a new process? Um, Fork is not supported on this platform, so there's kind of a few different errors that could occur, but a negative one return value indicates that that, that error occurred. Um, and kind of good, good practice is always checking for this. Um, you don't, the, the, the textbook versions will always abort the program, print out an error message whenever this occurs. That's not always what you want to do. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, this is not a requirement for Lab 5, but kind of in a robust proxy server, different system calls might error. The proxy should just uh, like not handle that request, but the whole server should not go down when that happens. Though it, uh, the, <clears throat> it is not part of the grade for the lab that it's fine if your server goes down. There's a, a portion of the lab where I am asking you to submit a test case for uh, 
some program or, or example input where a proxy server would fail that would not be caught by the provided auto grader because the provided auto grader is very simple. Oh. So when I connect to the server and forks, is there like two connections actually between the client and the parent client child? If I was the client to that, do they now see that they have two connections? Like I see you have to close that in both cases. So if that closes, they can't be twice. Yes, yeah, so this is this is an important uh, part of what's going on here. So the client So the all the client has is its one file descriptor that it's that it's that it has for the socket connection uh, to the server. So if we look at uh, echo client, all it has is this one file descriptor that it got back when it opened a connection uh, to the server. So our client just has its one file descriptor. But when we fork a process, our child gets a copy of the parent's file descriptor table. So all the files that were open in the parent are now also open in the child. So this is not copying uh, the like kernel uh, data structure, like keeping where it's, it's reading in the file, uh, it's not copying the file in memory, but the child it basically inherits all the file descriptors uh, from the parent, which means in this case, our child here has both the connection file descriptor and the listening file descriptor. It gets both of those from the parent. And because our kernel keeps track of how many file descriptors reference a given file, and it won't close that file until all those descriptors are closed, it means that even when we close, say, the connection in the parent, if it's not also closed in the child, then that file will be considered kind of open forever. So uh, one change that we do need to make here is that we don't want after the child returns from echo for it to become another, for it to like enter this server loop. We just want it to uh, uh, handle the echo function. So we'll have the child exit uh, after it returns from echo. And before it exits, we'll, we'll have it close the connection file descriptor once it's finished interacting with the client. And because the client copies all the file descriptors, there's another one that we could close. And that's the one that the server is listening on. Because the client doesn't need to listen and accept new, uh, the, the child doesn't need to listen and accept new connections. It's just handling uh, this existing connection, uh, echoing messages back and forth. Does that make sense? Questions? Does it like also come like the standard output or the standard input? Like if I have something that goes the standard input to a child, the parent also get that same standard input because their child's computer is a copy, or are those not? Um, so the child is a separate process, so I think it will have its own. Uh, uh, I think we'll have its own standard in, out, and error, um, but I'm actually not sure. I would need to, to test it to see. Um, because it's, like, it's inheriting the file descriptors, uh, but every process has a like, standard out file descriptor. Um, and so I guess, I guess if you were running in a terminal, and the process you're running forked, and the child process was printing out, you, I would expect you would see it in the same terminal. So I guess in, in that sense, 
they both share standard out. It's standard in that I'm not sure of, that if you sent input to one of the processes, whether both would get it, I'd, I'd need to test to see how that actually works in practice. Other questions? All right, so we have this uh, um, uh, concurrent echo server now. Uh, so let's compile it. And uh, we can uh, go ahead and uh, run it on port 1234. I'll get a second tab going here. And have an echo client. And I took the contents of echo.c and sent that as input to the echo client. So that's what it sent uh, to the echo server. The echo server got all of those bytes and, and, and sent them back. Um, if uh, we wanted to see that this is indeed concurrent, we'd need three different things going on here. And could open up uh, a normal one, and then have this other one. It gets connected, and when it exits, so the, the server can now get multiple connections. One of them can be running, another comes in and handles that just fine. But at the end of last time, uh, Nina asked a good question, which is when the child process is done, what happens to it? If we look in the code, we see that it's exiting. So we might think that's good enough that the child exits and it gets cleaned up and, and it's all fine. However, uh, if we say uh, to make this, um, so if we say suspend our, our echo server and we look at, okay, what processes are currently running, See that there's some of these echo server I, there's multiple of these echo server I processes. And if I have it show me more information, as well as more processes, we can see that uh, the ones that are, are labeled defunct have this Z here under their status, meaning that they are zombie processes. And that's because when a child process exits, the parent process might want to get some information about you know, what went on in the child. Did it complete successfully? Was there an error? And so the operating system will keep these stopped or terminated child processes around until the parent checks on them because it needs to keep them around in case the parent asks for what was their exit status um, so that means that uh, if I say uh, fire a thousand uh, clients off at the server, happily kind of keeps forking off new processes for, for all 1,000 of those. Uh, and now if I look at uh, there's a thousand zombie processes just hanging out on the system. So, the good news is that these zombie processes take almost no memory. Like the memory they're using, that has been deallocated. The thing that they're using is a process ID. They all have, they're all sitting around in a process ID. And uh, process IDs are uh, on a 32 bit system, you have uh, two to the 32 possible process IDs. So if you have your echo server running for a long time, servicing millions of requests, say over weeks, and never cleaning up these zombie processes, eventually it runs out of process IDs and the system starts getting very sad. 
So we really want to, uh, the uh, uh, terminology is be more appropriate if we were doing this on Halloween, but we want to reap the zombie children. So we'll close the server. We'll go back to our, our code. And when we talked about exceptional control flow, we talked about a process could get a signal from, say, the, from the kernel. And this would interrupt it and direct control into a signal handler, some function dedicated to handle a particular signal. Anytime a child process exits, it sends a sig child signal to the parent. Default behavior is just to ignore this. But if we want to clean up our, if we want to, to reap our zombie children, uh, then we're going to want to handle that signal. So we can have a function, um, call it sig uh, child <coughs> handler, and uh, it will take in uh, the signal, not that it will use it. And then all this handler is going to do is it's going to uh, reap all the zombie children that exist. And it can use a system call to do this called wait PID, where you can wait on a specific uh, child process ID to uh, be finished. And if you pass in a process ID of negative one, it, wait, it waits for any finished child. And uh, we can pass in null for, uh, we could pass it a pointer to give us some extra information about the child, but we don't care. So we'll just pass it null. Uh, and then we pass it an integer, which is kind of a bitwise combination of different settings to control the behavior. And the important one is that we don't want this function. If, you, if we called it like, uh, uh, without specifying this w no hang. If we called it and there weren't any children to clean up, it would just sit in this function forever waiting. It would, it would block until there was a child to clean up. So we pass it this w no hang to say, if there are no children, just return immediately. And so while this is greater than zero, uh, while it's returning, um, uh, 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 when it returns zero, it indicates there was no children uh, that it waited on. So while it doesn't return that, we're just going to uh, loop again and just keep calling wait PID to reap, uh, reap a child. And then once we're done, we'll just return. And the last step is to uh, tell uh, this process that we want to handle the sig child signal using this uh, uh, sig child uh, handler function. So uh, if that all went according to plan, I forgot a closing bracket. Got it, first try. Um, now, if we run our server, oh, this might be taking that up. Interesting, is there an, oh, I'm running echo client. I want to be running echo server, there we go. Uh, now, if I fire off my thousand uh, clients at it, and I look at 
the processes that are running, there are no more of these zombie processes sitting. So we have, we have reaped the zombie children, we have uh, saved Mantis from uh, the undead hordes. Uh, what are your questions about uh, uh, this, this signal handling child process, John? So the zombie children exist originally in case we need to like reserve some information from their process. How do we know like when it's okay to read the zombie children? Like we won't need the, the information anymore. Uh, so it's whatever, uh, how do we know when to, when to read the, the zombie children? So it's the logic of whatever parent process is forking the children, like whether it matters what. Uh, the exit status of the child was. But uh, you might imagine in uh, a, a more high stakes server than one that just echoes something back and forth, that if we forked up some, some process to like handle some complex user request and something went wrong, we might want to know that so that we could say retry that request, fork another child to retry it. Uh, and the only way that we can know that something went wrong in the child is it called, say, exit with a non-zero status, indicating that an error occurred. Uh, and so we need the operating system to keep around the child processes when they finish so that eventually the parent can check, uh, check their, the, the status. Uh, and the parent, through these different system calls, can either uh, sort of say, oh, is there any child for me to check? If not, I'll just keep going, or I'm going to wait and do nothing until this particular child finishes. Um, so this kind of combination of fork and wait, you can express a bunch of uh, many different sort of logical paths through the coordination of the parent and child. Does that make sense? Did you have another server? Uh, could we accidentally reap zombies from another process? No, we can only wait on our children, uh, uh, on the children of the current process, which means process that we ourselves forked. So, so I understand that the wait PID does, like, it's just, you know, make sure of the zombies and stuff, but how, how does it actually do that? How is it, like, is it, what's this checking in thing? Like, what does that, that mean? Uh, so the operating system kernel is maintaining uh, a data structure of current processes, and it knows, because the fork is a system call, it knows which processes are children of others. So when a child process terminates, the kernel sets up some data structure, like this process terminated, it's a child of this other, this was its exit status. Uh, and then it keeps that around until the parent waits on the child, or the parent exits. Um, so in it specifically with that function, wait PID and uh, like check in function that says you're free to go. Like, uh, there, it, wait PID is not the only. Um, like there are a number. Uh, there's also wait as well as wait PID. Uh, there's wait ID. So there's different system calls that are all like different ways of waiting on a particular uh, on a particular child. Uh, but yes, it will keep. The zombie processes around until the parent has waited or the parent has exited. And will this one because it's because it's like will this check if this is checking on all like child processes, won't it also loop through any other processes that aren't zombies as well? Or no? So we wait as so the way, there are different ways that wait can be called. I, mean, I don't want to get too bogged down in the details here, but this wait says, I'm going to wait for any child that has terminated, and if there are no children that have terminated, I'll just, re just this function just returns immediately. Any other questions? All right, so there are some, some pros and cons to this sort of process-based concurrency. Um, it's kind of the, the model is like nice and, and straightforward, that uh, our child processes 
share in the file descriptors, which is useful because that means a child can use the socket that the parent <laughs> opened. Um, but they don't share uh, uh, global variables or any other kind of memory. Um, and so, and we have this kind of API fork and, and wait to coordinate between them. Um, and so that's, that's all nice, but we do have this overhead of, of creating an additional process involves some work on the operating system kernel's part, some uh, uh, memory allocation. Uh, so there is some overhead and this isn't the case in this example, but if we did want to share memory, like share some variable between our children, that would, there's not a convenient way to do that when we have separate processes. The separate processes are deliberately isolated from each other as far as memory goes. So we might want to be able to do a less kind of heavyweight form of concurrency uh, to make this same, uh, this same server work. So uh, the, the picture of a process that uh, uh, we might be uh, used to thinking of is that we have both our uh, kind of our process context, uh, which includes our registers, our uh, stack pointer, our uh, program counter, kind of our special registers, uh, and it might also uh, include kind of uh, kernel information associated with the process, uh, like our page table, uh, our descriptor table, the uh, break pointer determining where the, the top of the heap is, and kind of along with that we would have the actual Kind of code, data, and, and stack. We have some uh, region that's the stack. And our stack pointer points to the top of that. Uh, we have our heap break pointer uh, to the edge of that. Uh, we have a section for data, a section for code, so on and so forth. One way that we might kind of reimagine this, uh, uh, this picture is to say that our, kind of on this side, we'll add The kernel context. So uh, over here now we'll have our page table, break pointer, descriptors, and we'll think of uh, this side. And we'll move the stack, uh, the local part, to this side where we have our stack, and we'll rename this to be the thread context. So we can think of a process as having 
uh, information about its current execution, its current stack, its registers, instruction pointer, stack pointer. And then separate from that, we have the memory besides the stack uh, and the kernel context. And this lets us uh, kind of imagine a world where we don't have a single one of these uh, threads inside of a process, uh, but instead we have multiple threads inside the process. So we have another thread with its also with its own stack, also with its own copy of registers and, and stack pointer and, and so on. And so this means we can have kind of multiple distinct kind of logical flows of execution. Uh, multiple uh, threads that each are on a different part of our code uh, that have their own uh, stack for, for local, uh, local variables. Uh, and this means kind of within a process, we can achieve kind of concurrent operations by having multiple threads uh, inside of our process. What are your questions about, about this, this diagram up here? Oh. Does the kernel handle the threads just like the other processes? Yes, so now uh, our kernel can, uh, or our kernel will, schedule which threads are going to run, just like it, uh, we've talked about it, scheduling which processes are going to run at any given time. And so it can switch between uh, multiple threads, or if we have multiple CPUs, each thread can be running on a different CPU. And so a single process can be doing uh, uh, multiple things at once. This picture also gets at uh, when we have when we're forking on processes, it's very hard to share memory between. Them. Uh, but when we have multiple threads, they're all within the same process. They can actually all access the same memory. Two different threads can even access uh, the stack memory within other threads of the same process. Because unlike processes, which the operating system is saying, I'm going to isolate processes from each other. You don't have to worry about other processes messing with you. We now have, within a process, the operating system is saying, you know, do, do whatever you want. This is all memory that belongs to the same process. Uh, the threads within it can, can do whatever they want. Other questions? <clears throat> so, the benefit, aside from being able to share memory uh, more easily, is that uh, threads are somewhat lighter weight than processes. So, uh, it's About 20,000 cycles to create and reboot process where it's about half that for a thread. So we have pay half the overhead uh, to create and destroy uh, new threads than we do to uh, create and destroy new processes. So with this uh, threading, we can <coughs> take uh, another look at our making our echo server concurrent and I'll leave the, the child handler in there for now, that we would not need it if we were using threads. And uh, instead of forking off a new process, we're going to uh, 
create a new thread every time that a client connects and have that thread be the thing that uh, handles the client. So we'll, we can use this uh, library called pthread, short for uh, uh, POSIX threads, P-O-S-I-X. It's a uh, kind of something that defines uh, the, the interface for, for the threads and, and other system uh, components, but we can create a thread. And in order to create a thread, uh, we need a uh, thread ID uh, to, because each thread, just like each process has its own ID, each thread will have its own ID. So our, when we're creating a thread, uh, we give it a pointer to a thread ID uh, which it will uh, it will write to that thread ID with the ID of the thread that's created, uh, and we can uh, give it some uh, particular attributes. Uh, it, but in this case, the default is fine, so we'll say uh, null. And here we need to give it a a function to execute, some function that this thread is going to go run. So I haven't made that function yet, uh, but I will call this function uh, thread function. Uh, and then I can pass it an argument, um, which uh, will be my uh, connection uh, file descriptor. So now what I need to do is to make the thread uh, function and this returns a void star uh, so that the, the process that created the thread can get a return value uh, if it needs to and it takes in a uh, void star as well, so it just takes and returns generic pointers uh, because our kind of thread create, uh, uh, pthread create expects kind of these generic, uh, uh, the thread create has to accept a certain type of function, and so we just have this generic takes a generic pointer, returns a generic pointer so that we can uh, have the thread go run any function that just takes in a pointer to uh, whatever information it needs. And what I'll have this thread do is uh, first uh, detach itself. So a thread like a process, uh, we create it and then uh, once it's uh, we can have whatever uh, context created the thread wait for that thread to finish, um, which is um, <clears throat> is called join. So uh, we create a uh, a thread and then we can, uh, if we want to wait for it to finish, we can uh, join it and uh, like cleaning up a zombie process, this will uh, clean up the thread. The other option is to detach the thread so that whenever it terminates, it will just clean it, it will get cleaned up automatically. And so we have in the thread function, the first thing it does is detaches itself uh, from the context that created it so that it will be uh, it will be reaped um, automatically. Then it could call echo on uh, the argument. And so here I was passing in uh, uh, the argument uh, was the, the file descriptor. So I could say my file descriptor and just uh, cast my argument back to an integer, just assume that whatever was passed in was the uh, uh, the integer that uh, that I was uh, expecting. Call echo with that. Once that's done, close the connection uh, and then return.
So in this model of the concurrent server, instead of forking off a process, I'm creating a new kind of thread with its own local context within that one server process, and then detaching it, uh, and it will get uh, uh, reaped automatically whenever it, whenever it completes. Questions on this? Yes. Um, so, if you had to like, <coughs> the main, if I had told the thread to run the, the main function, um, the signature of main in terms of returning a void star and taking a void star, it, the, that, you can only create a thread that, for a function that matches that signature. Um, so there might be some way to kind of force main into that, um, or you could create a separate function that does have that signature that does the same things as, as main. Um, I think the, the problem you get into is that you can only listen on a given port uh, uh, once. So I, I think that this uh, calling, uh, opening a listening socket on the same port, uh, again, would, wouldn't work. But um, yes, you can, in, in general, you can fork, uh, you can create a thread to go off and do, do whatever you want. Other questions? Sam. Um, I think this is stupid, I'm not even going to ask it. But you have the initial call before when you were using um, forks. Mm -hmm. A client who called the server, the server would then create a separate like part of the server. Where is it? What exactly? And then that part was called the child, which was then interacting with the client. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we're just having the server run a another process. Like, what do you, I don't even exactly know what the different what the difference we have. Yeah, that's that's uh, a good question. What is the what is the distinction for these? Um, so in our in our process base, uh, we have our server process, and any time a client connection came in, we made an entirely kind of separate um, process, forked one off. Uh, and so we ended up with a bunch of these processes floating around, which we had to, we had to, we had to clean them up by waiting for. In our thread base, and, and I should say that the, the main complaint about this model from the perspective of uh, the Echo server is that it was there was some overhead to creating all these separate boxes. So now we have one single server process, and whenever a client comes in. we create another thread within that server process to handle the client. So we're achieving the same concurrency at lower overhead by creating these lighter weight threads within our single process rather than forking off entirely new processes. So that's awesome. I don't quite understand why, like how, how do you know how much each thread, how, to allocate, how much memory to allocate to each thread and stuff like that? Like, so uh, we know kind of how much memory it would take to store the registers and other kind of system context. And then uh, because this is virtual memory, the actual physical memory allocated for the stack will be on page faults, whatever okay. it actually ends up using. Okay. Chris? Um, for the lab, are we writing the code to use a particular one, or can we just choose? Uh, for, uh, for the Concurrent part of your proxy server, it's up to you whether to use threads or uh, or processes. Um, 
There's not, if, uh, if performance was really important, we'd probably want to use threads, uh, but for the lab either is fine. Other questions? So uh, the main thing that processes have that threads don't is this isolation. Like all these children are not um, uh, are can interfere with each other. So uh, I. A situation where uh, you absolutely want to use processes are if you have a shell and someone enters a command, you could start a new thread to run that command, or you could start a new process to run that command. If you start a new thread for each command that is entered, all of those commands can interfere with each other's memory because threads are not isolated. So our, our shell wants to fork off new processes so that all the commands the user is running get this kind of separate private address space. Silas? Yo, wait, so that's, that's where I don't understand it. If, how, how, how would the threads, how would they interfere with each other's memory? If they, <coughs> like, how, how would they interfere with each other's memory? So uh, we are almost out of time. Um, so we'll have to get to that question uh, next time. Uh, but I will we'll, uh, tease it with uh, here's a pretty simple program. Uh, it takes in one command line argument, which is a number of iterations, and it then creates two threads and waits for them to finish, and it passes that number of iterations to each thread. And all the threads do is increment a global variable count once for each of those iterations. And because threads are within the same process, they can both access this global variable. So this is how they would share memory if we want to like, this is a silly example, but if, if we wanted to uh, sum up a really long list, we could send off multiple threads to each sum up some portion of it. But uh, where this gets uh, uh, problematic is if I want to count um, and I say each thread should count of a million, I expect it to count two million, but instead it counted one million four hundred thousand. So something went wrong with how they were sharing memory, um, which will be our topic for, for Monday. Uh, so that'll do it for today. Uh, have a good weekend. Uh, Please get started on the, the proxy lab if you haven't already. The check-in post uh, is due Monday night, and I'll see you Monday. <laughs>